good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or good evening. And thank you very much for coming, and thank you very much for giving the opportunity for us to show a little bit about what we're doing to try and help tackle epilepsy at the John Radcliffe Hospital and with the University of Oxford. I thought I'd begin, though, by just talking a little bit about epilepsy more broadly. So hopefully you're all like this. So the cogs are all churning and the computer's working. I do hope you like this because it did take ages to do. <laughs> so the... But all of us, everyone sitting in the room at the moment, will have individual nerve cells that are firing incorrectly. That happens all the time. That's part of the human condition. But what happens in a seizure is that a network of nerve cells starts to fire incorrectly. And you can see that now the cogs don't line up quite correctly. And the seizure, so the focus can be in one part of the brain, or the network can affect all of the brain. But the seizures are a consequence of a disruption of neuronal networks. And the reason it's important to look at it this way is that epilepsy is common. So 5% of the population will have a seizure at some stage in their life. 10% of the population, if you include febrile seizures. So that means that at the moment, in the United Kingdom, there are just over 600,000 patients with a diagnosis of epilepsy. Epilepsy being typically diagnosed if a patient has had two or more unprovoked seizures. It's also important to say that epilepsy affects people across their lifespan. So it's not actually a condition just in childhood, and the incidence of epilepsy is now in the developed world, highest in the older population, that being over the range of, age of around 70. It affects all socioeconomic groups, and worldwide it affects, it causes about 1% of the total burden of disease. Now, some of you may have seen some of these pictures before. This is just to show that anyone can be affected by epilepsy. So it can affect famous Hollywood actors, famous authors. This is Dostoevsky, if anyone was looking at the stalls earlier. It can affect famous musicians, such as Handel, famous poets, famous artists, the royal family and princes. It can affect people who call themselves prince. <laughs> um, and it can affect famous leaders and generals, including Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar. Epilepsy has also been recognised for a long time. So Hippocrates wrote in 400 BC that this disease, which at that time was very much thought to be something different, something sacred, something that was spiritual rather than physical, was not like that. It was no more divine or sacred than any other disease and had a natural cause like any other. At that time, treatments were very different to today. So this is actually a picture at the time of Caesar. This is a gladiator being slain in the arena. And treatment for epilepsy at that time involved people standing near the Colosseum where the gladiators were dragged out, having been uh, effectively murdered in the arena. And people would take small clay bowls and try and collect the gladiator blood. And the gladiator blood was then used to treat patients who had seizures, the thinking that the gladiator blood had something very potent in it that could help help suppress seizure activity. If the blood was from a gladiator who had been beheaded, then that was thought particularly powerful, so gruesome times. If we move on a little bit to about the 15th, 16th century, then treatment for epilepsy at that stage was, again, not medications, but exorcism. And people were taken to priests rather than being taken to any medical healers. And in certain communities, even in the UK still today, Epilepsy has that kind of stigma associated with it, and patients may be taken to healers rather than being taken to a general practitioner. What has happened in epilepsy, though, is there has been a dramatic increase in the number of medications available. So this, if you can see the point, this was bromide was the first recognised treatment for epilepsy in terms of medication, but more recently there has been a dramatic increase in the number of medications available. This helps because now around 70% of patients will become seizure-free with appropriate medication. But for the 30% who don't become seizure-free, these patients can become very resistant to all currently available treatments. And the modern drugs, although they're, they're good and they're generally better tolerated, they're not necessarily more effective than the older medications. So there is a 30% cohort or 30% of the cohort of patients with epilepsy can have very difficult to treat seizures. 
we now do have a whole raft of non-pharmacological treatments available as well, including epilepsy surgery. And I did have a slide showing epilepsy surgery, but I took it out because it uh, potentially could be somewhat gruesome for people to look at. But epilepsy surgery can be very, very effective as a treatment for seizures. Removing the epileptogenic focus can help render people seizure-free, even if they've been very resistant to treatment before. Vagal nerve stimulation is a device that's a little bit like a pacemaker that stimulates a nerve called the vagus nerve, which then goes on to supply the brain. The vagus nerve tends to damp down abnormal brainwave activity, and so the theory behind the vagal nerve stimulation is you damp down the abnormal brainwave activity and so settle seizures. The ketogenic diet was actually discovered in prisoner of war camps, so this is a diet which involves very little carbohydrate, and it was noticed in prisoner of war camps that uh, there was a reduction in the instance of epilepsy. And so if you pursue a very high-fat diet for certain patients, this can be very effective. But the key thing that we need to do, even though epilepsy has been recognised for such a long time, is to better understand the causes of epilepsy and also to appreciate that epilepsy is not just seizures. It's far more than that. There are some very relevant comorbidities or diseases that associate with epilepsy, including cognitive problems, psychological problems, and the psychosocial impact of epilepsy can be enormous. In order to better address that, we now, a couple of years ago, founded the Oxford Epilepsy Research Group. And it's nice to have a slide that shows lots of names, some quite famous names, but the the thinking behind the Oxford Epilepsy Research Group is very straightforward. It's just to galvanise the hospital with the university so that the university is delivering clinically relevant research and the hospital uh, looking to phenotype patients, so understand patients at a clinical level more deeply. And then uh, together, the university and the hospitals can for hopefully form a partnership to deliver on clinically meaningful research. I'm going to talk about three areas that we're looking at. There's quite a broad palette that the Oxford Epilepsy Research Group looks at, but one of the strengths is that at the John Radcliffe we have the 7 Tesla imaging, which is ultra-high field MRI. And so this is now looking at a patient. This is a patient on this side in healthy control. And you heard in the last talk about a structure called the hippocampus. That's the structure that's illustrated here. And you can begin to see on imaging, so this is in vivo, um, so patients in the scanner, you can start to see the structure of the hippocampus in enormous detail. And hopefully you can all appreciate that in the patient with temporal lobe epilepsy, so these are seizures arising from the temporal lobe, that this hippocampus is somewhat smaller because there's an excess of fluid here. The fluid is bright. And so this hippocampus is small and shrunken. And some of these patients can go on to have epilepsy surgery, which, as I mentioned, can be a very effective treatment to try and help cure the epilepsy, hopefully. It's nice to show even more detailed imaging. So this is, again, imaging by one of our colleagues, Natalie Votes, at the FIMRIB Centre at the John Radcliffe. And this is now dissecting out the hippocampus. And you can begin to really appreciate the anatomy of the hippocampus. And what this can help us do is if patients then have this kind of imaging before an operation, and then we study the tissue that's resected at the operation and try and correlate what we see in the tissue with what we see on the imaging, then we can better prognosticate. We can offer that patient better guidance as to whether the seizures may be treated by the surgery, what complications may be evident, and that can help inform the decision. So this is part of the key thing that we're looking at, which is patient-centred research. Another area which is really being pioneered in Oxford is to look at epilepsy in a very different way. So we said that 30% of patients are very refractory to drug treatment. So there are lots of treatments available, yet the treatments don't seem to work. And that's despite us trying different combinations of treatments. And it's one of the things that was developed here was to look at epilepsy in a different way. There's this concept that emerged about 12 years ago, and the first publications were from here, looking at antibody-mediated epilepsy. So an antibody is a protein that the body generates to fight off, for example, infection. So if you have a common cold or if you have influenza, the body will generate antibodies to try and treat that. But sometimes, instead of 
attacking the organism, attacking the bug or the virus, it can start to attack the body itself. So that becomes autoimmune. So the body's generated this protein, this antibody, but instead of trying to deal with the bugs or the whatever it, the causes of the disease, it starts to attack self. We began a study with Epilepsy Research UK, looking at all patients with a new onset focal epilepsy. So this is epilepsy starting in one part of the brain and screened them for antibodies. And so there are around just over 200 patients. And you can see that, yes, the majority of patients are antibody negative, but there's actually quite a significant proportion, which is around maybe 10% that do have an antibody. And if we break this down, these are the various different types of antibody that are recognized. And the reason this is important is these are all antibodies that can potentially cause epilepsy. So maybe, actually, the reason that those 30% are so resistant to drug therapy is they don't have, if you like, a conventional epilepsy. What they have is they have an antibody that's driving the epilepsy, and it's not anti-epileptic drugs they need. They need something to suppress the immune response. And so for some patients with autoimmune epilepsy, actually steroids or other treatments, a completely new approach to looking at epilepsy, can be very effective. The third area that I just wanted to highlight briefly <coughs> was comorbidity in epilepsy. I mentioned that cognitive difficulties and psychological difficulties can be very common in patients with epilepsy. Up to a third of patients with epilepsy will experience depression at some point in their lifetime. The psychosocial impact of epilepsy can be enormous because if patients have seizures, even a single <coughs> seizure will result in patients not being able to drive for six months. That can have an impact on employment there can be an impact in marriage, and epilepsy remains a very hidden disease. Because it's episodic, and patients can sometimes, the seizures come, for, for example, only at night in some patients, it's not necessarily declared. But epilepsy is a condition that still, unfortunately, has a lot of stigma associated with it. And notwithstanding all of the good work that's being done in HIV and Alzheimer's disease and mental health illness, and all of those diseases are now conditions that we can talk about relatively openly. It's coming with epilepsy, but there is still a way to go. In order to help with that, one of our students, a summer student from a, uh, Stony Brook in New York, uh, who came over two years ago, developed the Humanology Project, which is now run uh, actually as a course at Stony Brook in New York. Um, and what this project looks to do is it has students who have experienced conditions like epilepsy or depression or other um, medical conditions, and they write blogs which are very open and accessible and try and offer a source of contact for other students who may be experiencing, for example, their first seizure or may be experiencing depression. And that, to our mind, is exactly the direction of travel that we should be going in because it is empowering patients to help patients with medical oversight as appropriate. So in conclusion, care in 2015 in some ways it's the same as Hippocrates was describing in 400 BC. Epilepsy is a disease like any other, and in some ways it should be treated like any other, in that we have multiple novel treatment strategies available that include medications and surgical treatments and stimulation treatments and so on and so forth. But the fundamental part about treating epilepsy is to allow patients to achieve their full potential. We need to evaluate patients holistically and address more than just seizures. And the key driver behind the Oxford Epilepsy Research Group is to have clinically relevant research to deliver patient-centered care. It is important to say that we can only do this with the help of a wide collaboration. And there are lots of people who are on this slide. There are some people who help us enormously who aren't on this slide. But actually, the people who help us most are our patients. And this is from one of our patients, who is a graphic designer. And we thought this was very appropriate. She has convulsive seizures, and she's brave enough to say just above the alarm clock, says their caution may shake. But we would argue that it is definitely time to wake up to epilepsy. And thank you very much for your attention and giving me the opportunity to speak to you about it.